Hello, I'm Barbara Rosenman, the Director of Oldham County Animal Control. I am here today with my friend and colleague, Michelle Culp. She is the President of the Humane Society of Oldham County. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Hi, welcome back. I'm Barbara Rosenman, the Director of Oldham County Animal Control. My guest today is Michelle Culp, the President of the Humane Society of Oldham County. Michelle and I were talking about the problems with confiscated animals or animals who have been in a neglectful situation or even a dangerous situation. Sometimes those animals can be challenging to work with. Yes, they are very challenging, just really, really from the very beginning. Because for one thing, you don't know how they were raised as young puppies or kittens. And it's so important in those first few weeks of their life that they're socialized. And if they're not socialized, then the problem becomes, can you ever get them socialized? Right, and that is a real issue, that the first 16 weeks of a puppy or kitten's life is equivalent you know, to the first 12 to 15 years of a human's life. Mm -hmm. So if those foundation stones weren't properly placed in the early months of that animal's life, then, you know, you will probably never have a safe, happy dog or cat. Exactly. They, they will never conform to what we think of as a, uh, the ideal pet. Mm -hmm. They may exist with you. Yes. You may feed them, keep them warm, give them that kind of comfort, but they in turn uh, do not reciprocate as what we're used to in pets. Right, right. So it becomes a very big challenge as to what do you do with that animal. Yes. Um, because we're all about the welfare of the animal. Right. So uh, we've seen many cases like that. Um, we deal with it the best we can. We try training, we try more socialization, we try to find that perfect home that can accept the fact that this animal may never be quite normal. Mm -hmm. And then after that, sometimes difficult decisions have to be made. Right. Right. I know that sometimes we will pick up or, you know, be involved in confiscated animals. Um, dog fighting is a good example. And people have in their mind that, you know, with enough love and training that you can alter an animal's behavior. And that's just, you know, I don't believe that that's true. I think sometimes you can, but certainly not always because animals have instincts and I have a golden retriever. I didn't teach him to retrieve, but every stick and rock he sees, he has this just incessant need to bring it back to me. <laughs> and it's like, gosh, you know, it's he's a retriever. He can't help himself. Mm -hmm. You know, a border collie sees a car go by or a kid run by and they have to herd it. And, you know, because they're a herding breed. So, you know, sometimes it gets very controversial when you have dogs whose history they're fighting dogs, and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether, you know, that dog was taught to fight, whether that dog was encouraged to fight, it's in that dog's DNA to fight. Exactly, they're hardwired that way. Yes. If the breeding in the very beginning was not um, um, done with selection, you know, if they just crossbred or inbred, you don't know what you've got hardwired in that mm -hmm. animal. And sometimes it doesn't present itself right in the beginning. Right. It may take maybe even a couple years. Yes. And then all of a sudden you've got this animal that's going to attack mm -hmm. um, small children, adults, and um, it's just a very 
hard thing to predict. It is. And something that we deal with in animal control is a lot of times the dog owner does not see the problem because when the dog is with its master, it's well behaved. It's looking at the alpha and what do you want me to do, boss? Mm -hmm. And then when the dog's out on its own, the dog is saying, hey, I'm large and in charge and I don't like the way you looked at me, you're going down. And the owner just finds it hard to accept, but mm -hmm. they're presented with irrefutable evidence. Here are the vet bills. Here's the ambulance that your yeah. dog did indeed attack and kill another pet and attack a human being. Exactly. And, you know, that same thing happens in cats also. Yes. Maybe they're not as harmful always as a dog because mm -hmm. just by pure size they're smaller. Sure. But we see that in cats too where mm -hmm. they just will turn on people and bite, scratch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they become a safety hazard also. They can be, yes. So. Luckily, the majority of the animals we see do not have those problems. Right. But there are that minority. Sure. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we have animals that we pick up as an impounded stray or a confiscated animal that we can fix the medical problems, we can put weight on them, we can rid them of parasites, we can make them a healthy animal, but you know, we can't always make them a safe animal and a sound animal and an animal that will be a good pet for somebody in the future, but we certainly try. Yes, and we do too. Right, that um, the Humane Society is no kill, Animal control is low kill. We only euthanize animals that are truly unsafe to be around or animals that are severely injured or have a highly contagious disease. But otherwise, you know, we make every effort, you know, to restore an animal to good health and find it a new home. Well, that's, um, maybe we should talk a little bit about what the definition of no kill it really is. That is controversial. Let's talk yeah, about that. Yeah, it is. I think in um, most people, that aren't in the rescue business or the shelter business don't realize that no kill doesn't mean that no animal will be euthanized. Um, no kill means that you will not euthanize any healthy animal or any uh, animal that's not aggressive. But surely in those cases where the animal is so sick, uh, the kindest yes. thing to do oh, is yes. to euthanize, or right. it is so aggressive you cannot place it anywhere that it's mm -hmm. not a safety hazard to um, the public, mm -hmm. then euthanasia is warranted. And that yes. is in that definition of no kill. Mm -hmm. So the way Where we Where does work, this definition come from? Um, there's a gentleman out in um, San Francisco that- Nathan Winograd? Yes. Yes, I've read his book and attended one of his lectures. I did too, mm -hmm. and he uh, was with the ACE, ASCPA, I believe, in San Francisco. Living right next door, or not living, but having a shelter right next door to animal control. And when he saw all the animals being euthanized, he sprung to action. So their um, mission was not to euthanize, so he would take the animals out of the animal control. And I believe he coined that no-kill mm -hmm. definition. So they still euthanize but they lowered it to almost no euthanasia. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we work so well together because the fact that we can take your animals into our program lowers your euthanasia yes, rate. Does. Because space, and that's one of the things where people start euthanizing is space becomes a factor. Yes, yes. And so we've kind of eliminated that problem mm -hmm. for our county. Right, we have. I think we're the envy of many counties. Mm -hmm. We're gonna wrap it up and take a break.
Welcome back. I have Michelle Culp, the president of the Humane Society of Oldham County with me today. We're going to talk about some animal issues. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Barbara. I'm pleased to be here. Good. In most municipalities, there's sometimes some headbutting between humane societies and animal control agencies. I feel very fortunate and blessed that you and I have such a wonderful working relationship with one another that Oldham County Animal Control very much depends upon the Humane Society of Oldham County to assist us in many situations. Yes, I'm aware of that. Um, if you talk to people across the state, uh, we don't, most uh, animal control um, offices do not have the relationship that we have. And it's a very good rela working relationship, which benefits both of us, but also the animals that we care for. Right, and that is the biggest problem that I see when I go to animal control conferences. And it's like, uh, the problem is that neither animal control nor humane society puts the needs of the animals first. They sometimes put their own selfish needs or their egos first or their budget first. And it's like really the thing that we have in common is we both are very concerned about the welfare of animals in our community. And people yes. do frequently confuse animal control and humane society, but we have two different functions. That's correct. I mean, you're a government um, entity and mm -hmm. we're a private nonprofit organization that relies primarily on uh, individual donations, grants, and fundraising. So we do come from a different perspective. Right. But that doesn't mean that we can't meet in the middle. Oh, absolutely. So. I have a budget. I know exactly how much money I have in each line item of my budget, which frees me up to do my job, which is not fundraising because I am a tax-based entity. It's, yes, that's for sure. And then the other aspect of it is we have no enforcement uh, control. So, uh, which is... Um, Really, we're glad to be out of that aspect of it. It is um, a difficult part of my job and a way that we assist one another. If a citizen makes a complaint to the Humane Society about animals in a neglectful situation, then you tell me, I go out and look at it and it's like, oh yeah, this is bad, mm -hmm. we can't have this. So, you know, I go through the court system get a warrant, confiscate the animals, prosecute the abuser. Meanwhile, these poor animals, they have short-term respite with me, but ultimately their long-term care and recovery, I'm sending them back to the Humane Society. That's right. And then we take it from there. We fully vet them, uh, microchip them, uh, do tests on them that are required and then that their physical condition may require. And then we also train them and then they go back into hopefully loving homes forever. Yes. So it's yes. a big cycle that the, this one animal is going through, mm -hmm. but because of both of our efforts, the um, outcome is really the best for that animal. Yes, agreed. All right, we're gonna take a brief break right now and we'll get back to you.
Hi, welcome back. I'm talking with Michelle Culp, Humane Society of Oldham County. Michelle, let's talk about the procedure to adopt an animal from the Humane Society or from animal control. What is your policy on adoption? Our policy is that um, people have to fill out an application, which we process. We look at their references, their ve um, veterinary references mm -hmm. in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. We look at uh, where they live. If they're in an apartment, do they have approval to have a pet? Mm -hmm. If they're in a home, do they have a fence or not? And we're looking at all these things to find the best fit for the dog. It's not the person that we're trying to fit. We're trying to find that home that the dog will more, more than likely stay in forever till mm -hmm. their last days. So not every dog needs a fence, but mm -hmm. some dogs absolutely have to have a fence. And sometimes size can be deceptive. We've had people come in and they want to adopt a beagle, but they live in a third floor apartment mm -hmm. and you know that you know, going on all day long and as active and digging as beagles are, they're not a good fit for an apartment dweller. Exactly. Or if you take a border collie who needs to have a job, Absolutely. has to have its yes. brain engaged all uh -huh. the time, or you have a real problem on oh, your yeah. hands. So yeah. we look at the He's going to rearrange your furniture while you're at work. <laughs> exactly. Or like in my case, when I have a great Pyrenee and uh -huh. you have that constant barking yes. because we're on guard all the yes, time. Yes, he's telling all those hidden wolves <laughs> and lynx, I'm on duty. Yeah. Don't even think yes. about taking these sheep. <laughs> and right, they're on the party line all the time. Uh -huh. So if you're in a small subdivision, and that's going on, you're gonna drive your neighbors nuts. So. Uh -huh. And they're going to be calling me saying, you gotta right. make this dog shut up. <laughs> so anyway, that's the things mm -hmm. that we're looking at. Then if the people also have other animals, we have to look mm -hmm. at whether, uh, if they're trying to adopt a dog, whether mm -hmm. the dog is okay with cats, if they have mm -hmm. cats. Uh, we look at whether or not it's okay with small children. Sometimes mm -hmm. dogs, uh, certain dogs are not going to be. Say mm -hmm. a, a big sized dog and you have a two year old running around, that may not be a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, we also look at um, if they do have other dogs in particular, we do meet and greets, what we call meet mm -hmm. and greets. They have to bring their animals to meet our animal. Mm -hmm. and, everything, if, and everything has to go okay before we finalize the adoption. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like in people... And that's a good idea because the resident dog isn't going to be as territorial at a meet and greet if it's outside of that dog's home right. as opposed to this new dog invading mm -hmm. you know, that resident dog's territory. That's a good yes. idea. Yeah, because it's uh, obviously the dog won't stay in the home if the two dogs... Right. And sometimes there's more than just another dog. Sure. There may be two or three. Mm -hmm. So everybody has to get along. Mm -hmm. Occasionally uh, we do um, do home visits mm -hmm. and we also check, um, you know, we verify what is on the application. Mm -hmm. Very important. So, right. It is. Sometimes yes. people will, you know, try to pull one on you. Mm -hmm. That's really important that you're so thorough. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about your foster program. Well, because we don't have a shelter yet, um, we do put some of our animals in foster care because we have nowhere to house dogs. Now we do have cats on site, mm -hmm. but dogs are our main problem mm -hmm. on where do we put them sure. until we can find a permanent home for them. We also have our uh, prison dog training program called Camp Canine. We have 18 dogs in that program. And um, most of our dogs go through that training but until we have an opening, if we take a dog in, we have to have a place for it, and that's where the foster family comes in. Sure, yeah. Eventually, we hope to have our own shelter. I mean, we have just been Well, donating. I know you had some land donated, and you're yeah. about to kick off a fundraising campaign. We are. We had seven and a half acres uh, donated to us. We're still smiling from that donation. <laughs> um, and we're working diligently now to put our plans together for our shelter and our clinic, because we also do uh, low-cost spay-neuter clinics. Yes. And um, we're working on that right now. We hope in the very early uh, you know, stages of next year that we're able to kick everything off. So. Well, that'd be wonderful. The county certainly will turn out and be supportive. We hope so, because we want the county to be proud of this mm -hmm. shelter. We want their involvement. We want it to be a place that they not only come to volunteer, but uh, we envision places for them to walk their animals. Mm -hmm. uh, also, 
we envision uh, taking care of end of life situations. Oh, yes, so yes, often, very important. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. There's a lot of people out there who are worried about what's going to happen to their animals if something happens sure. to them. Yes. So we're, uh, uh, we've got a big, broad-scale dream here um, that we hope that we can um, see happen one. Well, I certainly support you both personally and professionally and wish you well. We're going to wrap up now. Thank you for being here today. I've always enjoyed talking with you. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Barbara. I enjoyed it too, and uh, thank you for having me. All right. Catch you next time.